Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends. Episode 78 of the BJJ Brick Podcast. Uh, this is Byron, and I'm here with my buddy Gary. G, what's up, man? Nothing. Just chilling, illing, and getting top billing. <laughs> All right. Today is going to be a lot. Of, it's going to be a great day. We've got an interview with a guy named Vic Torres. He is a purple belt under Matt Sarah. Uh, we talk a lot about training and, and good, good advice. He also has multiple sclerosis, and he talks with us how he deals with that and how you doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu and keeping his diet clean are really helping him get to reduce his symptoms from multiple sclerosis. So, a uh, really cool interview, very motivating. Uh, Victor is a is a listener of the show and and we're happy to have him on here and share his story. Yeah, definitely can't wait for that. Uh, we are privileged to have Vic. Uh, so, uh, uh, definitely stay tuned for the for the interview. Gary, how's your week been, buddy? It was fabulous. Wow, I like the way you say that. that uh, <laughs> I don't oh, hear you hey, say that uh, a lot. You know, a great thing happened here this uh, last week is, uh, as you guys all remember, everybody who knows jujitsu or, or listens to our podcast, but, uh, you know, we had uh, Rolly Delgado on uh, a few episodes ago, and we were privileged enough uh, to get to do a uh, seminar with him. He came up here to Wichita, Kansas, to Fox Fitness um, to give us a seminar and on a Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, 12 to 3, and actually, knowing Rolly, we actually went long, uh, which is great. But um, also, uh, I got the chance to train with him uh, Friday night there also in, with a private lesson. So uh, uh, my leg locks are going through the roof, and, uh, and uh, man, I just learned so much. It was such a privilege, and uh, I had a blast. Yeah, they're going through the floor, your leg locks anyway. <laughs> yeah, and I'm telling anybody, if you ever get a chance to uh, to go to a, a Rolly Delgado seminar or you get anywhere out near Little Rock and get a chance to train with him, you'd be crazy not to. The, the guy is phenomenal, and not just a phenomenal grappler and teacher, but he's a very, very good person too. So uh, uh, definitely uh, check out his app, Legal Leg Locks. Uh, check out the school, uh, Westside MMA, and if you anywhere near a seminar, you can't miss it. Absolutely, he, the way he teaches is is one of my favorite teaching styles to learn from. Yeah, he he did a, he does an amazing seminar. So if you're able to bring him into your school, uh, go for it, and uh, he'll show up and, and teach you guys about leg locks. And at the end of the seminar, he opened it up for, hey, what do you guys want to talk about? Any any questions? And ask him about whatever you want to ask him about. It doesn't need to be leg yeah. locks, and he's just open for discussion. Yeah, well, you know the. The crazy thing about it is everybody knows him for leg locks. I mean, you, my Friday night lesson with him was more about Camoras, and you know he's he he likes he prides himself on Camoras. He really uh, makes sure his school is uh, well versed in Camora, and he he just loves the application of a Camora. And uh, so, man, I learned a ton with my Camoras there too. So uh, he he can show you anything. Cool. Now I got to worry about Gary having an even better Camora. So. <laughs> Gary and I are based out of Wichita, Kansas here, and we were recently shocked with the bad news that Amber Oxford has uh, breast cancer, and she's uh, got a, a really uh, difficult fight ahead of her. Uh, she's very young, a uh, very fun person to be around, and uh, always a great person to grapple with. She was on the show, episode 25, uh, Girls and Geese with Amber Oxford. Uh, guys, go back and check that episode out if you haven't heard it. Uh, get to know Amber a little bit. Um, and, and, you know, not just a great person, great grappler i mean she's something else i mean here's a here's a lady who owns her own uh, uh hair salon on top of that she works full-time as a nurse on top of that she's always in the gym you know that her husband owns uh, always training she's so uh, nice to everybody so accommodating my son my, my seven-year-old son connor he still remembers Amber from like the very first day Amber ever met him. Uh, you know, she's just so nice. She, everybody warms up to her. And, and like on episode 25, you know, Girls and Geese, she puts on, you know, these events just to get more people involved in this sport. I mean, she's just a, 
she's just such a wonderful person. And uh, so, you know, this community here, we just want to come together and uh, and help help them out. Uh, she she and her husband there, Chris, they've got a long road ahead of them, and uh, you know, and and such great people. We just want to uh, uh, try to make it a little bit easier for them. Yeah, and wh- while she's going through her chemo and her surgeries and things like that, she's not able to work, and and that's, that's tough on anybody to lose. Uh, any, any couple that loses, you know, one of the uh, working members, that's that's tough on you financially. It adds a ton more stress to your life. It's just, uh, it's it's more bad news on already the the devastating news you've already gotten. So, uh, our buddy Matt Lowe has put together a little event called Choke Out Cancer Grapplethon, uh, and it's, it's a local event here, and we're really looking forward to uh, giving be given a chance to help Amber out here. Um, it's going to be uh, May 16th, uh, so next month. It's at Fox Fitness here in Wichita, Kansas, uh, 7330 West 33rd Street North, Suite 110 here in Wichita. But um, it's just uh, it's just going to be a fun day. It's uh, um, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And uh, I'll let you talk about it, Byron. Uh, let you kind of explain how everything's going to work here. Yeah, what they're doing is they have uh, – you pay 20 bucks to enter – and, and you get to grapple basically as much as you want. Uh, we're going to be having uh, three matches going at, at a time. At least three Yeah, matches. from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So uh, tons of, of grappling and pe- meeting people you don't know and and, uh, and getting back with old buddies and, and get some of that time with them. It's going to be a really great time. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to attend this event and uh, uh, just, I'll just be out of town, unfortunately. But uh, – Hopefully we're going to help them out and raise a bunch of money. And if you're not able to attend this event like me, you could still contribute. You could just – I'll put a link on our uh, show notes here on the website. Uh, you can go there and just donate money to, to the cause and, and really help them get to their goal and, and help relieve some stress on somebody who's already uh, very stressed out in a, in a tough spot in their life. Yeah, and like Byron said, this is just a, a come together and, uh, from Wichita and surrounding areas and, and uh, get to meet some people you don't know. And when we're talking about matches – this is really just – it's an open mat. There's yeah, There's no yeah. points. There's no winners. There's no referees. You come and go as you please. You can do gi. You can do no gi. There's going to be food for sale. Um, it's just going to be a good day for a good cause for a great person. Yeah, and it's – it's you, you donate money to something like this. It doesn't – it's not going to make the problem go away, but it makes the stress of the problem of her not being able to work. That We, we as a group could help take that away. Yes, and that's what we're trying to do. So uh, you might be in New York or California or somewhere in Europe uh, or anywhere in the world. You could still go to this link and and help out a fellow grappler who is who's at a very uh, tough spot right now, and uh, just you know count your blessings that you have that you're not in that spot. Uh, I hope you're not anyway, and uh, and just share when you can. And, and it's, uh, it's when you're able to help somebody out that needs help. It, it's a great feeling for yourself, and and you know the money's going to a, a, a good person. Yeah, good person, good cause, and uh, and uh, we're praying for Amber. Amber's our good buddy, and uh, we'll do anything for Amber. And uh, special thanks, especially like Byron said earlier, to Matt Lowe. Uh, Matt Lowe uh, putting all this together, uh, the brains behind this, because definitely we're lucky he has the brains, because as you guys have probably seen through 78 episodes, <laughs> Byron and I aren't too smart. <laughs> hey, we... Yep, uh, we're fortunate that he stepped up and he's he's organized this event. So, uh, big thanks to Matt Lowe on that. Gary, I've got an idea before we get into our article and uh, quote of the week. Got a, and I fun would idea. probably venture to say this idea is somehow making fun of me. It seems like that always happens. No, it's not. Oh, Although man. that would have been uh, funny. And uh-huh. uh, if you want to stay tuned towards the end of the podcast, I try to pull a prank on Gary. And uh, I'll, I'll probably put that at the very end after the music starts rolling. And uh, Gary doesn't fall for it at all. So, uh, <laughs> the well, king of pranks. I'm not going to fall for it. Well played, Good Gary. Good try, though. I like it. But um, we're on episode – what are we on? Episode 78, 78 here. I think it would be fun to to have the listeners go back and look from episode 1 to episode 50 and, and send us an email at bjjbrick at gmail.com and who you want – us to bring back on the show from uh, one of those uh, first 50 episodes. Man, that's awesome. I like that idea. So maybe if you're going to go through the list, kind of look at the who we have, and and uh, if you haven't already heard it, check them out. 
and send us like your top two or three people you like for us to return. We'll pick them. Obviously, we have their contact information, so that part's easy. And we'll uh, we'll try to get a repeat guest of whoever you guys uh, select as a. Uh, I have votes. actually heard from one person who said uh, they wanted uh, Craig Kennedy from episode nine, but that was actually Craig Kennedy himself. So I don't know if that really counts. If you can vote for yourself. Well, we'll see if he email if he just sends an email. He might uh, he might just get himself nominated there. Yeah, yep. <laughs> so definitely send us out an email. Tell us uh, who you'd like to see us talk to again, and uh, we'll try to arrange that. Yep, I think that'll be cool. Yep, let our listeners pick the next guest. Yeah, just go to uh, bgjbrick dot com. Uh, you could just scroll through the first fifty episodes and and try to figure out who you'd want to be back on uh, who you'd want to have back on the show. And I think that'd be a fun thing to do. Get a repeat guest here. Well, Gary, we have a quote of the week from uh, Ricardo Castaneda uh, from the last two interviews. It was a last two, two weeks. Yeah, so he's from uh, jujiology.com, and uh, we'll go ahead and play his quote. Here we go. I think my favorite quote is the one on my site by Master Hinzo Gracie, the fighting is the best thing a man can have in his soul. And, I, you know, that, I take, it kind of hits me in a personal level because my mom, you know, ever since I was a kid, she'd always tell me, you know, you're such a fighter. You're such, you're such, I've always kind of done my own thing. And I marched the beat of my own drum. I've moved from city to city with nothing but a backpack on me. And so, you know, every time I, I every time I, uh, you know, encounter adversity or encounter some kind of struggle, you know, she's always admired my ability to get past it. And without asking for help, I've never really asked her for help. And I hate when my mom asks me for help. And I know some, or sorry, offers help, not asks me for help. My mom asks me for help. I'm always there for her. <laughs> you know, I hate, she offers, I hate when she offers me, you know, some kind of help. And I, you know, I have to refuse her because I'm trying to do my own thing. And she says, no, 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 please. It, it means a lot to me. And then when I refuse, she starts feeling bad about it. So I have to take a $20 bill from her whenever, whenever I go visit her. Right. And so she's, she, anyway, she's always, she's always admired my, my, uh, my resilience and my ability to overcome anything that was kind of thrown in my direction. And so she says, she says that she's admired that trait in me since I was a little kid. And I think that, you know, I think that that saying by Master, Master Henzo, you know, I think it's, it's huge because I think the, the, best thing about a person is their ability to overcome odds. You know, life's not easy. You know, I was at a Dracolino seminar uh, last year, and uh, he was talking about how there was a black belt ceremony, and he was talking about, he gave a spiel at the end, I think a few people got their black belts, and how he was so, you know, impressed and inspired by the level of difficulty that it takes for people to get their black belt. And he said, you know, he kind of compared it to other martial arts where black belts are kind of given away for cost of tuition. And he says, you know, black belt is a very, very difficult belt to attain. And he says, he ends the speech with, for the rest of my life, I hope it's the same. And so it kind of, it kind of led, it made me think about all the struggles that I've had in my, with my judicial tenure. You know, it's funny because being the purple belt in my school, I'm one of the, one of the higher ranked belts. Uh, it's weird because we have maybe one brown belt and everybody else is black belt in addition to everybody being under me. So I'm kind of in the middle somewhere, but higher middle. Everybody thinks that, oh, he's got two straps on his purple belt. He's been training for five years. This guy, he's got it, you know, he's got it made. It's always easy for him. You know, he doesn't understand the struggles that we go through. And I go through the same struggles every single day of my life. You know, every single day, there's one, you know, there's a little piece of me that says, oh, maybe I shouldn't train today. Oh, I'm tired today. Maybe I shouldn't go this far. I have my thesis due. Maybe I should not do, maybe I should not train today. And maybe I should work on my thesis a little bit. And so I have these same struggles, the same obstacles that most people have every single day of my life. And so I think that my ability to fight through these struggles and continue the course and to brave the storm, and like I said earlier, just keep showing up regardless of what's being thrown at me, I think that's probably one of the things that resonates with me uh, with me most as far as one of my favorite quotes. So that was Ricardo from Jujiology.com presenting a quote from Henzo Gracie, fighting is the best thing a man can do for his soul. It can get you arrested, though, if you're fighting in the street. <laughs> Yeah, um, actually, fighting, fighting is probably not the best thing you can do for your soul. But yeah. just to have that spirit that you're not going to give up, you're going to uh, embrace you know, the struggle and, yeah. and do well. I think this this sport is filled with people with that kind of spirit, and I think this sport, you know, wrestling, MMA, boxing, kind of draws people with that spirit. It's such a tough sport. You think of how many people you've seen quit. Um, because the people who stick with it, like he said, he's a uh, purple belt and uh, been around for five years. To stick around for five years or even three years, you've got to have have that instilled in you. It's a it's a tough sport. You're going to take a beating. 
it'll either make you tough or you'll quit or you, you you're tough when you walked in there and you you enjoyed the yeah. struggle yeah. of things well i think a lot of people re- don't really do it don't have that in mentality and they just want to do it just to get the shirt and tell the girls they trained <laughs> yeah maybe yeah uh, but yeah it's uh you know there's so many struggles so many ups and downs and you know, I like what Ricardo was saying. He's, uh, you know, he's got his thesis due. He's, he's got, you know, his girlfriend. He's got his cat. He's, he's training. He, he's finding time to do all this. He's got all these obstacles coming in his life, and uh, he is still finding the time to uh, make sure he gets to the gym. He's still finding the time to make sure he gets his thesis done. Uh, the music is telling us that we've got to get on to our article of the week. And we got a good article this week, a is, little different. Is it? We got an article about bananas. Oh, Gary, you're driving me bananas, man. <laughs> uh, What's the website see. here? It's gourmetgrappler.com. Uh, gentleman, his name is McKenzie. He is a uh, competitive grappler, and he is also an award-winning chef that lives in New York City. So nice credentials there. And, and he writes articles. He interviews people. But this one, he, he wrote an article about... Uh, bananas, and he did bananas. like a little review of bananas and and what he thinks of them. And it's it's funny; it's got lots of jokes sprinkled throughout the article, so that helps you read it. But uh, Gary, what do you think about bananas, buddy? Well, you know, bananas are a staple of people's diets. I mean, you walk into a grocery store; what's the first thing you see? Bananas. Uh, you go to a, a tournament; people always got bananas in their uh, their bag. Uh, you know, great great food. Um, great for our sport. Yeah, great I like that. Any sport. Yeah, any any athletic thing, and anybody who's just trying to eat healthy, you know, consider bananas in your diet. Uh, they're available year round. So, like, I like to eat peaches and nectarines and pears, but they they have seasons. So, like, you get used to yeah. eating them, and then they're gone for a while. Bananas they're grown all over the world, and they're shipped around. So, uh, you can get them any time of year. You don't have to really change your habit if you make it a habit of eating bananas. It'll just be constant for you. Yeah, and you don't just have fresh bananas. You have dehydrated bananas you can eat. You know, That's, banana yeah. chips. So a lot of different ways you can eat the bananas. Yep. Bananas, uh, he talks about all the benefits. He's got a huge list of benefits. High in potassium. They've got vitamin B6. They add fiber to your diet. They have calcium and iron. Um, if you cool, if you put them in the fridge, they can cool you off on a hot day. You can put them in your drinks. A lot of, a lot of cool stuff. You can throw them in your ice cream, Gary. Although you're not a big ice cream guy. Me? I love ice cream. You're a big ice cream guy. I'm a big ice cream guy. All right. Yeah. yeah. Hey, going back to that, what I really like, you said high in potassium. And, and I always heard it's high in potassium. And I always heard, you know, potassium is great for your cramping. And and anybody who's rolled with me knows for some reason I always cramp. And, and uh, so I would always take a banana and always help me. But the other part I like, I didn't realize, but potassium, it says, is credited to lower blood pressure. Which, uh, you know, another great benefit right there, too. So uh, just makes me uh, realize how, how beneficial bananas are. Yep, they're good for you. They're very uh, cheap as far as fruit or just food in general goes. I, I probably buy six bananas a week. and uh, Between my wife and I, we finish them in that week. But they're about a buck for six bananas. Yeah, so that equals out to how much per banana, Byron? Uh, yeah, about, seven, six, about 16 and point three three. Less than cents. a quarter. Yeah, way less Winter. than a candy bar. Yeah, yeah. So definitely get them at the grocery store and like in bulk because if you buy them at Quick Trip, they're like a dollar nine each or something, ninety nine cents. He, he he talks about when you should eat them. You can eat them when you wake up in the morning. You can eat them before you train, after you train. They're going to help you out. Uh, just kind of, I would recommend experimenting and see if they kind of affect how you how you're doing as yeah. far as if you feel better. You know, I hear a lot of people will have their cereal in the morning and you know put slices of bananas on it. Another good way to good way to eat your banana there. Yeah, there's they go with so many different things. I you know what I hate banana candy. If it's a banana flavored candy, I don't want it. But I like yeah. bananas. I don't know. The, I think the fake flavor is driving me crazy. Yeah, but you know what I really do like? I like banana bread. Banana yeah, bread is awesome. that is good. Yeah. They add a bunch of flour and sugar to it. It's going to turn out pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you know the other good thing about this article too. He, like you said, he's a chef. He gives some recipes, uh, which I think is kind of neat there too. Yeah, a real simple thing with a tortilla and some. Uh, honey and, and peanut butter. It looks it looks delicious. Yeah, and yeah. The banana and peanut butter. You can't go wrong with that. He also talks about how to keep it uh, from going r- too ripe too fast. 
And then he also gives you a tip about if you want to write up a little quicker, how to do that yeah. as well. See, those are great tips right there because I didn't really know how to write them up quicker. And I'd hate it when my wife would come home with, a, you know, a bunch of bananas. And, and I hate them when they're not ripe. And it was just horrible. And uh, I just have to sit there and wait day after day after day until uh, till they got ready. Yeah. Just put them in a the brown paper bag, buddy, and they'll, they'll ripen quicker. What yeah. I like to do when I buy bananas... Uh, I'm the idiot that like you'll see one or two bananas by themselves. I get I pick those up where I make those happen by ripping up like the big clumps because I don't want them all to ripen the same day. So oh, I pick I some that, that are so a little more ripe. Some get, some, rip quicker. Get, get some get some get some green ones. Get some that are a little bit green and get some yellow and get one that's you're gonna eat today. And, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, hey, that does make sense. I yeah. like that idea. So little little trick there for you at the grocery store, and they don't charge yeah. any different. And I've never tried that. I like that. Get one with a sticker on it, so you could actually uh, you don't have to look up the number. So. Good, good call. <laughs> but check out the article. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's on gourmetgrappler.com. It's the review of bananas yeah. and uh, lots and of humor. One last thing on this article, I like where he says. So the name of the game is not about should or should you not be eating bananas, but how many are right for your activity level. So definitely go get some bananas. The more active you are. Eat more bananas. Yep, and it's, it's great tournaments. Great, just a normal day, anytime, man. So. Yep, man. I tell you, this show is just going bananas. <laughs> it's just because these hosts uh, are, are are making that happen, I guess. Well, with our interview, or man, well, with the article of the week wrapped up, I just want to mention that we have an email list you can sign up for at bjjbrick com or. Uh, on our Facebook page, just type in your name and email address, and every Tuesday you'll get an email. And at the bottom of the email, there is a link to some free audio books that I've made. Uh, it's in a Dropbox folder. So uh, if you want to check those out, want a little bit more of the BJJ Break podcast, we've got them in there. And I've almost wrapped up my audio book that we're making uh, uh, that's called Your First Year of BJJ, and that'll be for sale shortly. And I guarantee it'll be on the New York Times bestseller. So uh, get it for free before it gets to that. <laughs> oh, Gary, your guarantee just went down in quality, my friend. <laughs> we'll go ahead and roll our interview with our friend Vic Torres, and we'll be back with you guys to wrap up the show. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. Every time he gets a submission, Subway gives away a free sub. He can get you a toe by three this afternoon with nail polish. He has lost more than one tooth teaching the kids' class. His bucket list can be used as an actual bucket. It often holds ice, gauze, and Vaseline. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Stay listening, my friends. All right, my friends. It's my pleasure to bring Vic Torres to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Vic, how are you doing today? Good, Byron. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, got a little bit of training in earlier today, and and uh, I've been l- looking forward to talking to you all day. How about your day? I, yeah, great day. Um, I actually did a naga last week, and I uh, pulled a chest muscle, and I got heel hooked, so I heard a little pop in my knee. So I've been resting this past week. Feel real good. I'm gonna. I think it was really smart for me to take out a week off, and I'm gonna head uh, back to uh, training tomorrow. And uh, I just got done training my guys in my gym over here, and I'm really excited to be on this uh, show, and I want to thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. I think you've got a, a really good message to, to deliver, and uh, excited to have you on here. Could you introduce yourself to the audience for me, please? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Rita Torres. I'm on Long Island. I'm from Wanto, New York. I uh, train at Sarah BJJ uh, in Huntington and Levittown. I'm a purple belt underneath Matt. Um, I also have fought MMA and kickboxing before, and I, I like training. I, you know, I teach a kickboxing class. I have a, my gym here where I teach, uh, boxing, kickboxing. And, um, I, you know, I've been a part of, uh, jujitsu and boxing and MMA for a long time, about seven, eight years, training with a lot of these up and ro- up and comer UFC fighters, Ally Quinta, Ryan LaFlair, great guys. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that's kind of my experience with uh, my martial arts. I've been at Belmore Kickboxing. Uh, I sparred against a lot of monsters over there, and now I get my butt kicked at Sarah BJJ. Uh, that's all the time. 
bunch of monsters there. <laughs> that sounds fun. Uh, what got you into uh, training? Um, my friend Ally Quinta. He's a top fifteen fighter. Uh, he's fighting this Saturday uh, in the UFC. He's from my high school, and I went to see him before I played football there. It's a local college, Division Two football. And as soon as I was done playing football. It was one. I was very drawn to the UFC. It was kind of like the Tito and Chuck age. Yeah. And um, and Al was going to this place. I think it was called Thai Sport in New Hyde Park. And uh, I walked in the door, and they had the mats and the cage. I'm like, I have to be a part of this. I was an aggressive guy when I was younger, but I didn't know how to, you know, tunnel my my aggression in the correct way. I thought playing football was it, and I just this wasn't really me. Once I started rolling and training, I realized that this is this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Well, cool. Could you tell us a little bit about your uh, what you do off the mat or your life off the mat? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have two daughters and a, a wife who deal with my obsessiveness with you know jujitsu, and they really <laughs> understand. Uh, they 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 really get me though. Like we plan vacations out on my tournaments. <laughs> this is how how uh, awesome they are. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I've been a part of a payroll distribution company for about 10 years. I, uh, bounce on weekends on Fridays and Saturday nights at a place in Rockville Center. And I teach kickboxing at a uh, nearby gym. And then I teach personals in my gym here at my home. Cool. Well, you sound busy and it sounds like you have a very supportive family. That's, that's awesome. Absolutely, yeah, it's huge on the mind, knowing that my family, you know, they understand that, you know, daddy and, you know, likes to do the wrestling and the stuff, but it's, you know, for them, it's it brought me to have a, a place where I, I have my own gym in my garage, and I use it for business purposes sometimes, and I get my extra rolling in here, and hopefully one day, you know, achieve my black belt, you know, be a full-time instructor, or have my own school, you know, that's the main overall main goal there well cool how has uh, jiu-jitsu helped you off of the mat jiu-jitsu has been huge for me off the mat uh i was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2010 um i was at the beach in long beach new york i thought i got stung by a jellyfish and i ran out of the water and my legs were feeling like sensitive to the touch really really strange i didn't know what was going on and then i was walking really weird too uh, I was losing my balance, and it wasn't really painful or anything. I, uh, I started developing pins and needles, like you could fall asleep at nighttime on your leg. And um, I went to the doctors. They told me that I was maybe a sciatic nerve, you know, like maybe I, a disc was hitting one of a nerve, and that's why I was having this weird feeling in my legs. And I went home, and I was like, I guess it's not that big of a deal started getting worse. I couldn't go upstairs. I couldn't go downstairs. I, I was really losing my balance. The, uh, the pins and needles was getting worse. I was getting like blurry vision and I really had no idea what was going on. I went back to the hospital. Same lady was there and she's like, Oh, maybe you really have something serious going on here. Gave me an MRI and they found 11 lesions on my brain and one on my spinal cord. And they told me that I had multiple sclerosis, which I had no idea what that was at that time. And um, what they said is that my brain is pretty much attacking itself. They don't, it can't it, it distinguish uh, the good from the bad enzymes in my brain or something like that. And it's whip, like having a whipping effect and leaving these scars on my brain. And this is why I'm having these symptoms of lost balanceness, blindness, pins and needles that went to a level where I never want to ever ever feel that ever again and um a couple of other symptoms where it just was really really crazy for me to take because i was an athlete my whole entire life i really trusted my body and it just felt like within a second everything failed me and i didn't know what i was i thought my life expectancy was going to go down i thought i was not going to be able to compete anymore in jiu-jitsu or mma and um they told me i had to go to the hospital for a week. I never spent a day in the hospital yeah. and they're sticking needles in my spinal cord and MRIs every other day and making me take beer drinks. And it was, it was brutal. And I had my daughter and it was just crazy. I, I cannot imagine uh, one day feeling fine, go to the beach and you get 
uh, some weird sensations in your legs and you can't, you know, you, you go and you try to figure out what it is and, and they tell you, uh, you know, just you're all right. And then uh, yeah. a little bit later you, you find out you have this and, and it's how that like from one day thinking it's you, you've got nothing. And then to get that news uh, all of a sudden, um, that, that sounds very traumatic and, and like a, like a very difficult thing to, to wrap your mind around. Like you said, you were, you never, you know, spent time in the hospital. Now they don't want you there for the whole week and they're putting needles in your back and all this stuff. Yeah, it was brutal. Um, I turned white as a ghost. I actually thought I was going to, like I was going to live to 40 now or something like that. Or I, I knew some Montel Williams, the, 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 the TV, TV guy. Host. Yeah. He has multiple sclerosis. So the number one thing I did was go online and look him up. And he, he has a really bad, like way worse than I do. And it was, I should have never done that, you know? Yeah. I, I, everybody goes to the internet when they first, <laughs> you know, Man. become their own doctor. And that was a really silly thing for me to do because he suffers way worse than I do. I go to these MS walks every year and it's, it's brutal to see these people, what they go through way worse than I do. I'm extremely lucky person to have what I have and not go through what others do. Other people are like paralyzed and permanently in house, you know, with air conditioner on, never leaving their home. You know, or if they do, they're in a like an electric wheelchair. So I'm kinda lucky where the, I have my uh my lesions. So how does uh MS affect you from day to day? what are you doing differently now? Well what I have to do is definitely Oh, it was lucky for me that I was already fit, but, you know, it's definitely staying on top of it, always having, like, because I could definitely teeter off, uh, you know, my fitness if I don't have a competition in front of me all the time. So it's nice, you know, it's not nice, but it's always, I always have that, hey, you have multiple sclerosis. You have to be on top of your game here. You can't fall behind. It's going to show. Um, if I allow myself to get lazy, the MS takes over my body and it makes me ultra lazy. I get this crazy fatigue from MS. I just, you just don't want to do anything. And that's totally not me. I'm an active person. I don't want to be doing nothing. And this, this comes over and, uh, comes over me and makes me not want to do anything. So drinking a lot of water, changing your diet up. Um, and, and the, uh, what really helps me is jujitsu, jujitsu with the pulling and the pushing and the squeezing. Uh, that's all really great exercise to, you know, fight through the MS, uh, pins and needles and the, and the balance loss. And, um, me being on the floor, instead of like standing up and trading shots with somebody like kickboxing, it, it's more comfortable, uh, for, for somebody who has multiple sclerosis. Well, it sounds like it's a great fit for you. Is, so jujitsu is your primary uh, method of exercise or doing other things as well? Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> If I do anything for uh, fitness wise, it's for my jujitsu game. <laughs> so I run for jujitsu. I lift weights for jujitsu. Um, so I, I just try to do that because I have a bunch of killers at Sarah's, and um, if I'm not doing something extra, I feel like what's the point of even going there? Because I'm just gonna get my butt whipped. <laughs> That's a great gym to go to, and. Uh... I know you're you're training hard and everything like that, but it uh, there's going to be those type of days anyway. You know, like anybody goes in there, they're going to get their butt kicked. So oh, every day. <laughs> that's part I mean, of the fun, right? I just feel oh, absolutely, definitely. Don't don't get me yeah. wrong, but there's a difference between getting my butt whipped and breathing heavy, and just getting my butt whipped. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> and I just feel like you know, just for some reason that that uh, clearing my lungs really helps me out with my BJJ game. Uh, I felt. I, like I said, I did a Naga up in Albany uh, last week or the week before. I felt real comfortable. It was just really nice to know that you know you're not gonna you're not gonna lose because of conditioning or cardio. You know the guy's just gonna be better than me if he wins. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's a, definitely a good thing to to uh, tap going for you is, is your cardio and, and and somebody's always gonna be more technical and stuff. But to not be tired is a, is a great asset. Could you definitely. could you kind of describe your style of jujitsu? How you like to roll and techniques you like? Yeah, definitely. That's funny. How I was listening to your podcast today, I knew that question was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm definitely a top player. I was a wrestler in high school, and uh, I when I first came over, I was always on top and top game, top game. And then I got, but it was almost an insult when people would tell me that, "Oh, hey, are you a wrestler?" 
wrestler or you're a wrestler or you're a wrestler because you seem like a wrestler. And I just like, I didn't want to be labeled as a wrestler. I want to be labeled as a jiu-jitsu guy. So I really worked my guard. I mean, my guard's not that great, obviously, but you know, I just would not, I would, after a couple of uh, years getting comfortable with my game, I decided just to work on my back, you know, no matter what, all my back, all my back, all my back. And then I reached a certain point, and then I wanted to go back to top game. So now I like passing. That's my most favorite thing, to pass somebody's guard and get into side control or uh, mount, uh, take the back or whatever, look for submissions there. I don't mind being on my back, but it just seems every time there's a competition or anything, um, I'm always on top. I'm always trying to be on top, definitely. Cool. Um, so w- w- with... You mentioned already that you you have a gym uh, in your garage, and and then part of, part of your condition is that you need to stay uh, training regularly. And if you start taking days off, they kind of build up really fast, and, and it kind of takes you out of the swing of things. Does having that gym at the house like obligate you to train more? Like this, you can't just like not go to the gym. The gym's already there. Does that affect you at all as far as that goes? It's it's a beautiful thing. It's one of the best things I have ever done. Um, I live in a two family house. So, uh, me and my wife and my two daughters live upstairs and my, my mom and my dad and my two brothers live downstairs and my youngest brother is my best friend and one of my best training partners. So me and him would just come down here. Uh, we have a TV, uh, and a computer. So we put the YouTube on and listen to, you know, Marcelo Garcia, Henzo Gracie, John Donaher, Matt Serra, uh, any of the guys from Altos, big, name guys and just practice the moves here on the mats uh when we get our butts kicked at sarah's we go over it here on the mats to make sure we get that extra help just always something that we think that people maybe not be doing that we can maybe get a step ahead of somebody because uh, in bjj it's all about mat time and and if you're not putting the mat time in you're not going to you're not going to get where you want to be cool how how often are you competing i try to compete uh I would love to compete like every once, two months, but it's been like three or four months, every three or four months. Uh, my daughters are on dance competition teams and, and they're receiving their communion this year and stuff like that. So weekends are rough sometimes, but I'm um, always trying to compete. Uh, always looking for, I'm always online on the websites looking for uh, nearby tournaments. Cool. Does your younger brother compete with you? Yes, absolutely. He's a monster. <laughs> He's uh <laughs> I just so I'm so happy that you know we get to do this journey together. Uh, you know I get to see him get promoted. He gets to see me do well and stuff like that. We have our bad days. We have our good days. We can we're there for each other. And um, when I get to see him, you know, dig deep, I and and you know win a match or give a good guy a hard time. We just the, the respect factor and that love is, can be, is even more enhanced. You know, I didn't think I could love him any more than I do. And then when he goes out there and he just, you know, he just pushes in and he wins by a point or something like that. And just, I got to see that. It's just beautiful stuff seeing your younger brother do something like that. And just like, this is what's up. This is this is why this is why we do this. That's awesome, man. It's always cool to see uh, two brothers training together, and it seems like it's a, a significant advantage to have that. Definitely. Uh, I've been beating my brothers up. I have two. My other brother is a Marine, a former Marine. So um, <laughs> I beat them up their whole entire lives. I gave them a hard time. Uh, I didn't think it was a hard time. I wasn't trying to be a bully or anything. I just thought that's how I, you know, that's how it is. You know, I was, as an older brother, just giving your younger brothers a hard time. And they ended up being really tough guys <laughs> out of it. <laughs> and they both can probably kick the crap out of me now. <laughs> Man, that's cool. Definitely. Could you uh, maybe share some competition uh, experiences or stories with us? Absolutely. Um, I'm thinking. I, I had a couple. I, I had one. My I had one MMA fight, and that was in New Jersey. I did a silent fight league, and I remember going to this small club, and the club was probably the size of my garage, with like 100 and 200 people packed in there, and they're all rooting for my opponent, who was like the. the uh, you know, that he's from that town. He's, yeah, he's that the, guy, the guy, you know? yeah. <laughs> so his name is Jay Brawl, and it's tattooed on his back, and he's short and stocky, and he looks like he's going to take my head off. And uh, I get up, I go up to the, the cage, and 
I'm just looking at these people just curse at me. Like, I'm just not in it. You know, like, I'm just like looking at these people <laughs> and they're like, you're going to die. And you're screaming at me. I cannot believe that I'm doing this right now. And, uh, I throw, I go out there, I throw like this nice little pitter patter jab and this guy comes throwing heat, connects with me. I take a terrible shot. He puts him in a guillotine choke. I'm just standing there 20 seconds into my first MMA fight, six weeks of training and I'm getting gagged to death and I ended up peeling off his, uh, I, I think I pretty much grabbed his MMA glove and got her off my chin or underneath my neck. And then I took him down, pretty much just laid on top of him for the first round. In the second round, I started feeling a little bit better, and I was breathing. I uh, got a nice shot in, connected with him. I went to go for a guillotine choke after that uh, shot that I landed. I slipped right off, and uh, he started punching me. Uh, I had him, he was in my guard, he started punching me ground the pound, and I snuck uh, my leg over his shoulder. I grabbed my shin. He brought me up in the air, slammed me. Uh, I locked up my triangle. He picked me up again, and he slammed him one more time. And then after that, he tapped out. And uh, never been more tired in my whole entire life <laughs> than after that one. That was crazy. That's got to be an uh, uncomfortable feeling to be hated by by everybody in the room, you know? And then oh, my have... God. Shocking. It was, I, did, I didn't want to be there. I yeah. couldn't believe that. I, you know, you, you know you're, getting pop, you're peppered up. You're all, you know, getting pumped up downstairs. My, I wanted to fight MMA more than anything at the time. You know, this is what I wanted to do. And I'm sitting there <laughs> as I'm going up to the, you know, upstairs to the, the cage. And they're like, Jay Brawl, Jay Brawl. I'm like, they know this guy? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's just standing there in the cage waiting for me with everybody. They, they're like slamming on the cages, the fence and everything. It was it was an intense moment my my brother and my dad were there, and I had a couple of fans, so I heard them, and they're, you know, calmed me down. I had my corner with me, the guys at the Belmar Kickboxing Academy at the time, and uh, so I relaxed, especially after that first round. I, I really relaxed. I felt, much, I felt way more comfortable. Yeah. That's the one thing that you could, uh, as I hear your story about that, um, it's just, it is him versus you and everybody else in the room isn't, isn't a factor and, and who they want to win or anything else that they want to have happen. That really doesn't matter. It's one person versus another person, uh, MMA or Jiu Jitsu. And, uh, you just go out there and, and do your best. And it sounds like that's what you did. And, um, you know, you left a lot of people disappointed that night, but that's okay too. You know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I was happy to do that. Um, they, absolutely. You're right about the mentality uh, of competition, which is a huge thing for me. I've always had a problem with competition, uh, ang anxiety, I guess you can call it, or just kind of getting really nervous to, to the point where you're making it too big. And then what it is, it's just a fight. It's just a jujitsu competition. There's a billion of them every day. People do them all the time. There's no, there's no difference from yours to another person's. And, uh, if you train with good or camp, like Sarah's or Belmore kickboxing, it should be no problem. You know, you should be very comfortable with, um, you know, with yourself walking into uh, a, a competition like that. And um, for me, in particularly having MS, uh, my my symptoms would really be caused by, would be affected by nervousness and anger. So trying to fight was a real big issue. And I started off before my... Uh, MS hit, uh, I was diagnosed, I was 3-0 at the time, and I was really thinking about not, not competing anymore, I, I don't know if I should take, you know, uh, hits to the head with all these scars on my brain already, and, um, I mean, I'm not overly proud with it, and I'm, right now, as an older, wiser person, I probably wouldn't have done it, but I fought four more times, Yeah. Uh, after I had MS, just to prove it to myself, and, and naysayers, who said they couldn't do it. And I actually didn't really even have any naysayers, to be completely honest with you. It was more in my head. Everybody supported me. I have great people around me. There's nobody who would ever, who I think would think, you know, doubt me or anything and something like that. And um, I went two and two, so I got I got knocked out twice really bad. And um, I just still wasn't feeling like me. You know, my legs weren't bouncing out, up and down. I didn't have the strength that I did. I think my cardio is going quicker, and it's really hard for me to say that or blame it on something else 
but sometimes I have to realize that I do have an issue and I do have limitations sometimes. And that, that was really hard for me to understand that I'm not, I'm not, I, I have, you know, I have a limit, I have a limit, you know, I can't push it that hard. So after your MMA stuff, did you start taking jujitsu a little more uh, seriously or just dedicate more time to that? Yeah. After I realized that I just not growing up and getting, you know, when I was younger, I seemed to be a little bit more down for punching and, and kicking people, but I'm just not, I'm not down for hurting people like that anymore. I don't have the killer instinct. I think maybe having daughters or something like that made me soft and, uh, I just don't want to hurt anybody, and but I still love the art. You know, I watch every UFC. I watch Lion Fight on Access TV. I watch all the shows. I listen to all the podcasts. I listen to everything I possibly can. I love fighting. I just don't. I don't. I don't think that I should be taking blows to the head, and I don't think I should be hurting anybody. So jujitsu just is perfect. You know, it, it has the greatest environment, the greatest atmosphere, the nicest people in the world. I couldn't respect any more. I couldn't even respect these people anymore. And, and they're willing to help me. They're not jerks, you know? And you get, and the best thing about jujitsu, like if you're, there's a legend, you can meet them. No problem. You go to their <laughs> gym, you know? Yeah. And that's why it's so awesome. You, you want to meet Matt Sarah? Come down to Sarah's gym. He's right there. I, I, Matt Sarah knows me. He knocked out George St. Pierre. <laughs> like I knows me by a first name basis. And, and gave me a purple belt. He thinks I'm good enough for a purple belt. I don't think I'm good enough for a purple belt, but I'm not going to question the man. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I mean, the, the celebrities of the sport have gyms, and you can go walk right in, and, and, and generally speaking, they'll be there and yeah. with a smile on their face and happy to happy that you walked in their door. And that, yeah, Were you training with him when he knocked out uh, George St. Pierre? No, I wasn't. It was it was crazy because I'm sitting here, and I'm I was such a big Matt Sarah fan before I went to Sarah's. He was my favorite fighter, and you know I I'm really big on you know local fighters. I, I just it's so awesome to see all these local guys do so well, and and I didn't know him, but I felt like I did, and I should. You know, this is like this is so silly that he's a he has the best gym. Why am I not there? And uh, I had a friend of mine. Uh, Al the Dasher go to uh, Sarah's. He, he actually was training here at, at my gym, and he loved jujitsu so much that he went to Sarah's. And he, I was really just jealous of him for getting promotions and and being able to hang out with Matt and know Matt. And Matt had a Groupon thing. I went there. I paid twenty bucks. I mean fifty bucks for twenty classes, and I signed up for two years on my second day there. I mean I. It was yeah. it was it was like a bittersweet moment walking into that gym because I knew I should have been there a long time ago, and uh, but I was I was so happy I'm so happy I'm there you know it's, it's it, that that atmosphere that I want people who want to learn jujitsu just as much or or more than I do and I just it's just crazy and I just I'm very grateful to have a school like that yeah and those same people that want to learn jujitsu want you to learn jujitsu as well I mean Absolutely. they want to teach you uh, what they know and. And, and help you get better at, at your game. That's the best thing about it. Uh, that's why I took from it. Um, I, you just meet these monsters, and you never think that they're, you're going to reach to their level, and and because uh, they seem like they put their hard work. But they tell you how they got there. They tell you what to do, and if you listen to them and you're willing to put the work in, you can achieve that level. Maybe not as high as some of these guys, but definitely something similar to them for sure. Yeah. Well, having you know, I'm a big Matt Sarah fan myself. He's always had has exciting fights, and he's one of those guys that hits to the ground and he's going for stuff, and that's always yeah. fun to watch. What would surprise me if I uh, would roll with him? What would be like something that I, that I wouldn't see uh, coming? Or uh, he is he is he's ridiculously quick, um, and the pressure that he can put on is just crazy. Yeah, uh, it's just unbelievable. He. You know, I'm, I'm lucky enough every once in a while where he just takes me out of class and we'll just roll to the side for a class, a class. And, you know, I'm all excited. I'm like, I'm rolling with Matt. And then it just slowly <laughs> <laughs> I just get smashed past all day long. I don't know what to do when he's in my guard because he has such a great base. I mean, you know, what am I going to do? I <laughs> and it's not going to happen. And uh, 
at every inch or any time. I mean, like I'm, I'm trying to move slightly. I feel like I'm wasting a lot of energy against him. Um, his power and his pressure are are staggering. I could not. It's it's crazy. It, is there a position where he's got like a the most pressure from? Yeah, I mean, I it's, I probably it's like a like a side control, like almost teeter off to like a north south. Yeah, or chest to chest. And uh, just moving around, anytime, anytime that you're looking, anytime I explode or try to do an explosion, a, a big thing of my game that I try to do is be you no know, explosive here and there. He just shows me that that is not the way to do it, again, <laughs> especially about him. He'll just take my back and, and break me down, and uh, you know, hip into me, and I feel like I can't even breathe. The man's unbelievable, but nicest person yeah. in the world too. And and uh, as just a it's such a great experience to be with somebody who's a UFC, you know, former champion, Henzo, uh, Henzo Gracie, first black belt, and uh, on the, the Gracies, uh, I think, I think something like that. First Henzo Gracie black belt, and uh, and and I'm learning the lineage of of that. You know, his Max Sarah to Gracie to Gracie to Ilio, it all passes right down. I can see where it comes from. It's yeah. just amazing that I'm a part of something like that. That's cool. A, a little while ago, you mentioned that, um, like, like getting angry or getting uh, really nervous uh, makes your symptoms worse. What What are your symptoms that you experience? My biggest two symptoms that I had with the MS was pins and needles. It was pretty much just like um, there would be my feet and my fingertips, and then as I get if I got anger, angry at something or something really made me nervous or something, uh, what else would uh, make it come out? Sun, uh, the sun. Uh, that's a huge kryptonite with me. I'm, I just don't go in the sun anymore. If I can stay away from the sun, try to keep my cool, I shouldn't have any problems. But the pins and needles kind of go up like if you're controlling like a volume control and uh, – they reached a point where they, it's it's unbelievable pain. I just start sweating, and I have to try to stay still, uh, not move my back or my neck because when I looked down, it made it worse. And this vibration in my inside my body, uh, it, it just makes it's crazy pain. And uh, then the lost balance that I had, you know, just which weird, you know, going down the stairs and you can't even control where your foot's going to go next, you know, or you're trying to move around and you're walking kind of like on your heels because you can't feel anything right in your toes. It was, uh, it was definitely, I'm very happy that everything is back to normal. I'm very grateful to have that because for people who don't have the use of, you know, their hands or their feet, it's, it's brutal. That was brutal. I did not like that. So, so generally speaking, you're, you're able to not, uh, experience these symptoms at all or, or, yeah, um, I'm sorry. Uh, they over time, I've I've had it for five years. I took I was taking this medicine. I was injecting uh, myself with this medicine every other day, uh, and it was the medicine was really really painful. The it would go into my leg or my shoulder, and it would burn uh, throughout my body, and it would make me sick. It would have flu like symptoms. So they would tell you to take it. <clears throat> at nighttime so you would sleep with flu-like symptoms instead of being up with it it was just a terrible way of trying to sleep um i didn't like the auto injector pen that they had to put your needle in you press this button and it just stabbed you in the leg and so i made a conscious decision i read some books i did some research um outside of the united states it seems like people have a little bit better grip of ms than here uh, they have holistic diets, uh, fitness, drinking water, taking vitamins. It, it controls it. Um, so I decided, you know, if I didn't have any symptoms, I'm going to go off the medicine. And the last three years, I've gone off the medicine. I stay away from the sun. I never go to the beach. <laughs> I just go to jujitsu instead. And um, just make sure I'm always hydrated, always eating clean. And uh, I haven't really had any real issues. I mean, every once in a while, I'll see my foot start tingling or my feet start tingling, but it's nothing nothing compared to what it was when I first got uh, diagnosed with it in 2010. 
have you ever uh, like went out to compete uh, and then weren't able to to step on the mat because of your symptoms, or have, have you always been able to manage them since you've been competing with them? Um, I've definitely felt symptoms uh, leading into competitions or fights. Um, it's just it's just mine. It was kind of playing mind games with me. I take big breaths and try to control it. And just try to keep it to, uh, a, you know, where I can deal with, you know. Uh, I the, the, I had like five or six times where it came to a point where I couldn't like control it, where I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this pain. I need to call somebody. But none of those times ever happened during right before competitions. Um, what I've done almost, and it was almost dangerous, is try to stay cool and stay relaxed before fights. And almost stay too relaxed sometimes, where I'm not even not even up for the fight because I'm scared that I'm going to get too nervous for the fight. So uh, I always had it was always hard to find a balance of being up for a fight or being too down or too relaxed. And uh, it happened sometimes. Sometimes I got it right on the nail and I was fine, and then other times I was suffering. And uh, nothing ever too much where I couldn't compete though. Uh, I'm probably too, too cop. No, no, was too prideful to, to allow it to to take over and ruin something like that. Yeah, it. I I can't. I for some reason I just can't allow it to beat me. I know that it ha- affects me, but ever this this the, the the day I got, I knew I was going to beat it. There was no there was no chance that this was going to take over. And had, I mean, my doctor told me that they wanted me to sit in my house and with the air conditioner on and walk around my house twice a day for my fitness. I was just like, you don't understand. That's not going to happen. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, I don't, I don't know. I I don't know if the doctors or understand athletes or something like that, or just, you know, they're taking precautions for somebody as serious uh, MS, but I feel like you have to push yourself with multiple sclerosis. You can't just allow the disease to take over you. Uh, if you do, you're just going to end up sitting on the couch and, relying on people to, to do things for you and I, I i can't live that way I, can't. I have to be a father i have to be a husband i have to work i have to do jitsu i have goals in my life that i want to achieve and sitting around is not gonna get that done you know the, the type of pain you're experiencing is a lot different than um than other pains you have in life uh, like physical pains but being being of like the warrior mentality and doing uh, some MMA and doing jujitsu and and experiencing like discomfort uh, on a volunteer basis, you know, you're signing up for these activities. Does, did that? Do you think that helped you get through it? Because I think when the doctors say, "Here's what you're gonna do for exercise," they're talking to normal people who don't like exercise yeah. anyway, and they don't like the discomfort of doing it uh, at all. So, do you think that that maybe that those things that kind of that you know you toughened your brothers up, but also they toughened you up, and and, and really for this task that of of of, of getting getting through this, um, and and becoming fit and living a, a good lifestyle. Do you think that that your ability to, to kind of deal with that pain um, was ever uh, did you gain much from from jujitsu and MMA to help you with that? I think so. Um, with the level of guys that I've gone against and the adversity that they put you through, I mean, it's way worse than in multiple sclerosis. You know, I'm, I'm getting my, my face caved in by <laughs> professional guys and or I'm getting choked out by guys who are like sharks on the mat and I can't breathe and all I want to do is give up but I keep on pushing through and MS wants to put a little tingling in my arm or something like that and then doctors want to tell me not to do any of that stuff. That's just fuel for the fire for any jiu-jitsu guy or any MMA fighter, I, I guarantee that anybody in my situation would do the same thing that I did. I don't think that any jiu-jitsu or, or, or MMA fighter would give up and or just allow them to like roll over and die. Uh, that's not our spirit, I don't think. And from you know generalizing, but I think most of us would deal with it head on. And I think that something as difficult as MS, MS, you need to do difficult things to counteract it. You just can't just allow, you know, just relax and just be like, oh, I have MS, you know, feel bad for me. That was my biggest problem. I didn't want anybody feeling bad for me. I hardly told anybody that I had MS. And then I realized that maybe I could bring up awareness to MS if I can reach out and, you know, if somebody can hear me and let them know, hey, you get up and run, you do some light exercises, you want to try something like jujitsu, 
this this stuff helped me. This is positive stuff, and uh, it's a great atmosphere. It's a great lifestyle, and I think that all that stuff together has made my MS, you know, journey not as bad as as it sh- as it could have been. Everybody listening uh, to the. Uh- to this podcast now knows that the jiu-jitsu community is a, a supportive place and and we like to um you know like we we're saying like teach each other and, and make each other better and, and in that sort of environment what is the ms community like what have you experienced they're very tight and loving too um it's amazing to talk to somebody who understands what you're going through because i tell you pins and needles but that's that's not really it exactly yeah the the the, the loss of balance the fatigue. I tell you that I'm tired, but you don't. Know. I mean, I don't want to say that. You no, know, not everybody understands me. But the, the fatigue that we feel, especially when I'm in the sun, it's it's crazy. It's my body's just like you are sitting down. You're not moving. You you can't do nothing. And and I and to hear somebody else to relate with me on that. Uh, they have the message boards on online and Facebook. The uh, MS walks that they have are very popular. They have MS bike rides. Uh, it's it's a, it's another uh, breath of fresh air, like the jujitsu community that um, that you get to see that there's there's beautiful people in the world and it's not all crazy and, and violence. Yeah, that's one thing I think that um, you know maybe someone's listening to have MS, maybe they have some other kind of obstacle um, in front of them to reach out to the community that that shares the experience because that. That's a whole different uh, support group than just your friends and family. They know where you're coming from, and, and they're able to, to share similar experiences with you. And that, like you're saying, that's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely, a big deal. It was. Uh, I mean, it's, you don't want to you don't want to wish upon MS yeah. with anybody, but like when somebody can tell you that that you're feeling the same thing as you know they're feeling the same thing as you're feeling, and what maybe they what they do or something breathing wise or medicine that they took to you to get past symptoms and just having that support it's it's huge on the mind and with ms it's that's a big part of it too being being relaxed and and confident how how long you said you kind of wanted to you know not share with people and and tell them for a little while and not you know and then you thought hey you know i need to get awareness out there and try to do my help people um, how long until you reached out to the community uh, of, M- of MS and, and and got help through them? Um, it, it was it's it was rough. I've I've gone back and forth. Um, I I just you know you don't want anybody feeling bad for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I don't I don't I my life is great. You know, I just have this little little MS thing on the side, and but I feel. Um, that would be wrong for me not to just to just totally ignore it. And if I could help somebody, just one person, and that's it, that would be why that can bring me meaning. You know, that could bring me meaning to like for more of a life. I mean, I understand that I'm a father and a husband, but like to help people who I don't know, uh, to let them know about jujitsu. I feel like most people, you know, who have MS don't know what jujitsu is, and you don't even have to wrestle live. I would just want them to do like the techniques. And just do the moves, you know, and just try something. Don't just get up off the couch and, 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 and you know, don't give up. That's one thing about uh, Jiu-Jitsu is nice that um, you can custom fit it to your, to the way your body's going to be. Um, Absolutely. You know, you could start on the ground. You could, you know, generally speaking, if somebody wants to work top game, I'll let them work top game. If they want to work, you know, bottom, that's fine too. Like, people are going to work with you. Uh, to help you meet your goals, regardless of uh, you know, even if you're you have no condition at all. Like if somebody anybody wants to train a certain way, that's generally speaking what people will do for you. Um, what would what kind of a message would you tell somebody like a little advertisement for jujitsu? Um, if somebody who does have a mess and a similar symptoms that you have, I would just tell them that don't you know don't be intimidated or afraid to go to a jujitsu gym. They're the nicest people in the world. Um, I, I, I didn't first go to, when I first went to uh, Sarah's, I didn't tell them that I had MS because I just didn't want anybody to, you know, go light on me or anything like that. But if I asked them to, they would, you know, in two seconds, they would have helped me out and, and done anything that I, if I had problems with my legs, they would just allow me just to work with my hands and my feet. I wouldn't have to move around. 
they would all, you know, do whatever I needed to do to make me feel comfortable. And that's a huge thing with MS, being around people who are caring and great people and who actually, they care for me at Sarah's. And uh, it was just, it's just great, you know, no matter what, those people have my back and they make me feel very comfortable. And I'm also defend battling my MS and, and not feeling terrible symptoms that I would be doing if I wasn't doing jujitsu. And uh, I just think that I, if, you know, we can just, I, that's what I've been trying to do lately. That's why I hit you up. I've been, I've been hitting uh, some companies up about bringing up MS or maybe donating a, a you know, proceed or something like that to one of their products or some, and, and trying to make something, try to bring awareness up through this. I think that, um, taking medicine or shots every day is not, maybe that, maybe that's not just the answer. Maybe we could do more than that. Well, cool. And I think, you know, you know, you've got a great training environment there, Sarah BJJ, but that's jujitsu. I mean, I've been to a lot of different yeah. gyms in, in throughout the country and, and a few outside and they're, they're very similar. It's, it's the attitude, it's the culture of the sport, of the martial art that people are, are good. If you're not a nice person, you generally don't stick around in jujitsu. You know, they kind of run you out of there. And, yeah, and it's, it out, yeah. yeah. So I mean, even if someone can't go to to your gym and train, if if they're oh, yeah, that's somewhere right. I'm else, in all, I, I'm in all jujitsu. Yeah. Um, I've been a couple of plate, different kind of gyms before. Um, I, I I'm I'm probably even too trustworthy, you know, with the jujitsu community. <laughs> I just think that everybody is awesome. You choked me out, and I choked you out. I respect you. You respect me. I don't think that you're gonna ever gonna do anything bad to me. I respect you too much, you know. <laughs> And I always say that with my friends, you know, you're not my friend until you choked me out or I choked you out. I shouldn't do business to anybody who I haven't tapped out or haven't tapped me out. And I just feel like when you when you roll with somebody, there's that bond that you wouldn't screw anybody over, you know? Yeah. Uh, I just, I love, that's why I love Jesus so much. It does build that, that trust um, yeah. with somebody who had you in that, in a very um, vulnerable position and you said stop and they, they let go. I mean, that's, that that's if they didn't that'd be a big problem there but that's that's the way it is and and they'll they'll do that again and and you'll do that to them someday Absolutely. so you see it in the in like even in the locker rooms like if you're at a, a regular fitness locker room and you left your wallet or something behind that would be stolen in two seconds you leave it you leave it at a, a jiu-jitsu gym that will stay at that bench for two weeks you know yeah. before you come back and get it nobody's taking that and uh that's why this I love the that kind of atmosphere where it's just good people. Yeah. I'm I'm one for uh taking the wallet and cutting out like a <laughs> uh like a mag a picture about the size of their head on the in their driver's license and, and taping that over the, the driver's license so they have a new face and then putting it back where I found it and uh, let them deal with that uh later on. So <laughs> that's just me being a little ornery, but yeah, is yeah. people that yeah, I'm with you. People are are it's amazing. People, you walk into just a gym and their their phones laying all over the like uh, you know kind of laying around and it's just it, it's it's one of the the places in the world that you can go and people trust each other. Yeah, it's great. I just I, I love that. That's how, that's how things should be, you know. And uh, I shouldn't be having a locker with a lock or have to worry about my bag being all zipped up and whatever and just i'm rolling with you please don't steal my stuff you know <laughs> yeah or or you wouldn't be rolling with the person if they if you thought that they were going to steal your stuff like that's not a person that you would want to train with so you you've competed on a regular basis here and and uh and you had had some of your own issues to deal with as far as um, with M- with MS and, and and performance at competitions, what advice would you have for just anybody who's going to do the their first tournament? Breathe. <laughs> that that uh, you're going to uh, you're going to exert too much energy uh, if it's definitely your first tournament, and try to breathe and relax, and just think about it as a learning experience, and it's just it's just for fun. And it's not that big of a deal if you win or you lose. 50% of everybody in that first round is going to lose. Yeah. You know? And I, and I understand. I mean, I, when I do tournaments, I'm not there to lose, but it's okay. You know, and you, there's guys that are at certain levels. I mean, you do Naga, if you do the expert division, you're in the purple, brown, and black belt. You know, you're rolling with those guys. So you can roll it. You can roll with any kind of monster. 
and um, it just it's just the experience. And no matter what happens in that competition, you're going to come back to your your school better. It always comes back better. If it's a bad experience or a good experience, you went to that level. You felt where you had to go. You felt where your cardio is and how strong you're gripping or how strong your opponent was going after you. And you have that knowledge now. And you can take what you did wrong and, and learn from it and, and hopefully use it for the next competition. Cool. Do you have any advice for somebody who's trying to figure out like a good game plan for themselves? I definitely would think if you want to start it out, start your game is, you know, start maybe going online or follow your instructor's path and and find out what uh, what kind of guys you want to mimic. I like Le- uh, Leandro Lowe. Uh, I like his guard passes. So I, I go on YouTube and I, you know, I started grabbing like the sleeves of the pants now when I stand up and guard and, and try to. Uh, extend them and using my shoulder now and it's just like how he does and um and i can i can expand on that with my guard passing if you know if you want to be a guard guy just look up you know keno keening cornelius and just you see what happens and see if anything catches your eye what you like and then once you find your move then you find out everything off of that move and you keep on branching out yeah, sounds like a good plan, a good way to do uh, research. And it, it is frustrating for students to like, yeah, I want to work on my guard. You know, I want to get a better guard. And you go into class, and and this week we're working on uh, guard passes. Next week we're working on uh, back escapes, and the week after that uh, we're working on mount. It's like ah, oh, you can't. You know, like you have something you want you want to work on. Sometimes that's you know going online and getting that additional help and and and. Uh, a little bit of side education or doing a private lesson or, or something like that could really help you focus on and, and get to what, what your your passion, what your desire is and what you want to work on and, and get better at in particular. That's cool. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, you know, it, with it, what you learn in class is always important, but like sometimes my mind is not where, where yeah. we're learning at that mind. So I was thinking like X guard, you know, I, I want to learn X guard. So I'm always thinking about X guard sweeps, X guard, uh, you know, uh, transfers and transitions and, and then we're going over guard pass. Yeah. You know? So, yep. I mean, that's, that's fine. But, you know, before or after, uh, class, I'll try to get my X guard, uh, reps in. If I can ask one of the higher belts to see what I'm doing wrong because, uh, I wasn't doing a lot of right things with the X guard at first. And then grabbing somebody after class and just trying to get a little extra work here and there. And, Obviously, not disrespecting my instructor. And yeah, not listening to them and their moves and what they're trying to show me because it's just as important. Yeah, you've got to learn learn all the jujitsu, and and if they're showing uh, certain techniques, that's it's good to learn it. But like, I like how you're pulling somebody aside at the end of class and you're going over a couple little things, or or maybe your focus while you're rolling is on X card versus um, what they taught in class, which is perfectly perfectly fine. Um, let, let's say, Vic, that you've convinced um, somebody who has uh, MS to go and, and, and do jujitsu, and they and they they've went maybe a month or so, and they're enjoying it. Uh, what would be a good goal for them, uh, their first year of training? First year of training, definitely to, um, you know, possibly think about competing. You know, to see where their mind is, to see how they are in practice. You know, how how well they're doing during training. Also, um, just try to learn as much as you can, you know, as a, you know, as a white belt and not trying to, uh, I remember trying to go after people, you know, you have a blue belt, you have a purple belt. If I beat you, I'm a purple belt kind of thing. And, and just try to soak up all, do your reps, do everything per, try to do everything technical, even though, you know, you're not there knowledgeable wise and just try to soak everything in. And, um, Compete if you can, if you know, but that competing is not for everybody. So if you don't feel like competing, I just think that maybe challenging yourself against some higher belts and, and always, always having that. I, I like the three people thing, the person who's worse than you, the person who's on your level and the person who's better than you and always going back and forth with those and never getting too ahead of yourself and thinking that you're awesome because you're not and, and, uh, never thinking that you suck because you don't. And uh, just trying to stay a balanced, balanced mind, which is very hard for a white belt to do. Yeah, 
I do. Uh, I like that example of the three people. Um, train with somebody who's worse than you, someone who's about the same, and someone better. Um, can you just quickly here go through like how you should be training with each one of those people and what you would get Absolutely. out of it? Definitely. Um, I love training with everybody. I feel like I can learn something from everybody. Everybody has a different point of view, they're different sizes, different weights. So if I face somebody who's maybe a lower belt than me, there's no point for me to go hard on them or, or try to destroy them with smash passes. I think that's something where maybe I would try uh, a, some moves that I haven't done before and, and try to execute something that uh, is a little bit new to me, something that I've been checking out, but I probably can't hit this on one of the higher end guys. And then I always have that person who's on, on my level, uh, which, you know, is always trying to push you. And, and, um, but, you know, they're on your level, so they're not crushing you. So you're going back and forth. You want to try maybe not, if you get side control, not just to hold them there, maybe to advance more and go for a submission. And then that person, who is advanced and way better than you and kind of going after your bread and butter and, and, you know, trying to not allow, 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 allow them to submit you, uh, is always a great goal. So I always like the three person thing too. I like, you know, you, you see guys go with girls or, or women and they're just not going where, where the level that they should, you know, they, it's a woman, they're lighter than you, they're less experienced, you know, let them work. You know, you can see, you can work your game. You can, if I'm on bottom against a woman or a smaller person, I can put my feet on their hips. I can start working my my guards, my deli heba setup, and I never do that stuff. But now I can maybe try that stuff up now, and uh, and and then maybe work that off against the guys who are my level, and maybe one day to the people who are more advanced than I am. Yeah, I I do like the feeling of when you're rolling with somebody who's more advanced than you. I already know in my head. I only got three moves that might work. Like uh, I, all the other hundred moves I've been working on the past year or two, I'm going to put those on this bookshelf for now, and I'm going to try to get one of these three moves and, and see if I can get one of these to to work a little bit. You know, like that's when you got to bring that A game, and and, uh, and that's really sharpen your your skills there. But the biggest problem I ever had with the upper belts, or when I was like a when I was like a blue belt, probably about a blue belt with a stripe, blue belt with two stripes. I realized I didn't know any guard passes. I'm considering myself a guard passer, but I'm just kind of like reacting yeah. to what the person is doing on the bottom and just trying to stop it. And then when you reach a certain level, that doesn't work at, at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had to go. I, had, I felt like I actually got worse there. We're not worse, you know, like degress um, because I had to be I had to take a step back, be more technical and not rely on strength and athleticness. Uh, because that can only bring you so far. And if you're not really doing the moves or you're not really, I wasn't really doing anything. I was just reacting to what, uh, my opponent was doing. And, uh, I had to, I had to realize that, that I wasn't really doing anything. I actually have to do the technique. I have to pass this guard by doing proper grips, proper steps, and not just kind of jumping around and just trying to get lucky. Yeah. I, I, that's funny. Uh, you know, you're making me think. Um, I, th- I do see that a lot. I like the late late blue belt, early purple belt. Like, uh, you know, the past you've been doing for a while, uh, it's not going to – like you're, you're doing like 90% of the past, but you're you're kind of just the last like 10% of that past. You just kind of just don't complete. You let up a little bit. Yeah. And it's like you're not controlling my hips. I'm going to shrimp out. You know, if you're not controlling my legs, I'm going to get back in the scene. It's kind of – that's kind of a funny thing that, that, that they have to kind of figure out like, okay, I have to actually do a – a pass like step by step and end with something other than just hop over your legs and, and, and call it good. <laughs> yeah, I haven't really exactly. realized that, but that's, that seems to be the way it is. It's, and, and the even thing about doing step by step and, and doing the right technique versus somebody who's better than you. Yeah. So that's it, crazy. I mean, it's just like, well, how's that going to happen? And then you just start stopping there. I just feel like they're coming after me. They have their open guard. They're attacking my legs. They're trying to break me down, and I'm just trying to stop them, you know, from what they're doing. And I'm not really trying to do anything. I'm just trying to make sure that they don't do what they want to do instead of proceeding with what I want to do is pass their guard. Yeah, and it, when I'm rolling with the white belt, generally speaking, I'm going to 
they're going to pass my guard. I'm going to let them get get by and get side control. We're going to you know we're going to roll around and do some different positions and stuff like that. But like a purple belt or a, you know a solid blue, and I don't let them just do that anymore. Anyway, like uh, you know maybe I lead into the I kind of don't help the white belts by letting them just kind of flop on by. You know, like it's fun to roll though, but it's kind of a you're making me reconsider how I how I train with some of the some of the guys I'm rolling with on a regular basis. That's funny. <laughs> They'll be uh, they'll be upset about this come uh, uh, tomorrow. <laughs> uh, um, do you have any sponsors you want to thank or mention? I uh, definitely want to always hit out SarahBJJ dot com. Without Matt, um, I don't know. I would not know nearly any. I would know nothing. I don't know nothing now, but I would definitely know less than nothing uh, with, without him. Um, I would also like really like to thank Prove People Wrong. Uh, they have a website and defensesoap.com. Uh, they were definitely huge, uh, sponsors for me, especially when I was growing out fighting with MS and stuff. And they made me feel, um, you know, that was worth something. And that I just, it was, it was really nice of them for even them to even show me, uh, any kind of recognition or anything. So it was really cool about them. And I also have my website. If anybody ever wants to go to, it's TorresMMAFitness.com. It's just about my garage here and my training that I've that I've been doing here. Oh, cool! I'll put links uh, for all those on the show notes there. Thanks. Um, do you have any other contact information for people that that may have uh, may want to get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm on Facebook, Victorious Junior, uh, Twitter, VJ underscore. And Instagram VJ underscore, and uh, they hit me up anytime. Um, I'm always around, and I'm I'm definitely willing to help anybody else who has any any kind of issues health wise, and and looking forward to uh, you know improve themselves and and have a better life. Cool, that that is awesome, man. That's outstanding that you uh, give out your information and and then. You know, you're you're just a mouse clicking a couple of keyboard strokes away from uh, somebody um, from helping somebody. So that's really cool. Definitely, I mean, same thing with you, Byron. I mean, you and uh, Gary having the show and and getting the word out about jujitsu and and uh, I mean, again, the guys that you talk to, uh, your guests that you have are highest level dudes, and it's just amazing to hear them uh, be able to talk and their their experiences and giving a, uh, a guy uh, like me a chance to be on your show. I just appreciate it a lot, and thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a pleasure to have you on here. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of world champions and like that, but your story is is uh, is amazing, and it's, it's very encouraging, and is, it reminds you that jiu-jitsu is more than just getting on the mat and rolling around uh, for a couple hours. It, there's so much more to jiu-jitsu than that off the mat as well. Definitely, uh, it's a it's a beautiful sport with beautiful people a part of it. Um, it's a great how it's blowing up. I feel like this is the best time of the sport. Uh, I was just watching the Eddie Bravo Invitational the other day. Uh, Metamorphs card looks amazing, and just tournaments popping up every single day. It can only get better from here. And I'm just happy that I'm a part of the ride, and just can be a smart a small piece uh, to the big puzzle of Jiu Jitsu. Cool. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Vic, and. Uh... Uh, look forward to hearing from you in the future. Absolutely. Um, I'll be paying attention to you guys and following you. Tell Gary I say hi and thank you very much. Yep, thank you. I will. Okay, that uh, concludes our interview, or actually Byron's interview with Vic Torres. Uh, definitely a lot of good stuff out there. Uh, definitely a motivating interview. Um, I, I hate to say it. Well, I don't hate to say it, but it makes me want to get on the mats. He, it's uh, motivating. I I want to train right now. Yeah, it's amazing how uh, jiu-jitsu could affect you off the mat and, and keep you. Uh, it's, it's it's so awesome that it's fun, and we're able yeah. to to get to stay in good shape and to or to get in a uh, you know a healthy condition and and have fun with that process. Hey, speaking of that, this is one thing that I always think about. And sorry, going off topic, but you know we talk about it keeps us in shape, it keeps us healthy. You know, I'm wondering though, like what we're going to be like when we're 75 are our knees going to be arthritic our hands or we'll have a great heart and a big neck 
<laughs> will, we, will we be able to move? Will we be able to grip stuff? I, I always wonder about that because we do beat our bodies up. Uh, most of us uh, exercise and try to eat right and, and uh, meditating or recovering. But uh, we still, uh, you know, our hands, especially people train, training the gi, your hands take a beating, uh, knees, back, neck. So I always wonder what's going to happen when I'm 75, 80 years old. Gary, okay, one of these days, maybe maybe when you hit, hit 70, 70 years old, you'll start slowing things down a little bit, and you won't be trying to kill me and tap me out every few seconds. So uh, you know what we'll it'll be do? easier on your body if you slow down a notch, buddy. When I do turn 70, we'll, uh, we'll, have the, uh, we'll have an article about that. We'll talk about it. There we go. Just put a reminder in your phone uh, that will, that will like, send you a message when you turn 70. How do, how do you do that with a rotary phone? Just uh, dial that puppy up, man. Start cranking on that wheel. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're healthy. I think that's yeah. a big thing. And, you know, what you're doing to your joints and your the rest of your body is kind of up to you how you're going to treat it and how you're going to listen yeah. to it when you get hurt. You know, it's not uh, – we're not all going to end up the same. There are some people that are doing this that are going to end up a lot more beat up than others, and some will end up uh, – like Steve Maxwell, and, and just in great shape and happy and healthy and training for many, many years. Yeah, I guess that's a big thing right there. I, I do like what you said, and it brings me back to that Maxwell interview. And, I mean, take the advice of Steve Maxwell. You know, I, I like it how he, he makes sure he breathes. He, you know, he still exercises off the mat. He's just not doing jiu-jitsu. He's big into, you know, functional exercises, kettlebells and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, uh, that actually makes me feel better. All right. That's, that's yeah. what I'm here to do. I'm here to make you feel better, Gary. Well, thank you. That's my main goal in, uh, yep. today. Excuse me while I finish this banana. <laughs> You've been eating it the whole interview. That's that's a slow-eating banana there, Gary. <laughs> uh, you can catch us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, feel free to message us on either one. And you can email us at bjbrick at gmail.com. Uh, those, are, those are probably the best three ways to get a hold of us. We... Uh, enjoy interacting with you guys. It uh, means a lot to us to hear how you're doing and uh, if the show's helping you at all. Yeah, and, you know, we got a cool little email uh, the other day from our friend Andy Dickey, and uh, he was just, uh, uh, for some reason, didn't see the link for the podcast this week, and he was traveling to a tournament. And he wanted to uh, link to the podcast so he could listen to it while he's going. So uh, that really made us feel good, and uh, hope you had a good drive up there, Andy, and uh, hope you had fun at the tournament. And one other thing from Andy is uh, I see he's got a little, uh, you know, tag off our most interesting grappler of the world. He says he is the most interesting grappler in the world. When he signs up for a jiu-jitsu tournament, his opponent at least suddenly announced his retirement. I thought that was a pretty good one. <laughs> Man, you know, writing those is the hardest part of that whole thing. I just uh, I kind of well, there, stalled out on those, so I'm using old ones, but uh, I'm going to have to issue. make a new one. There. You, I can solve that issue. We need to hire Andy. The way he just did, uh, the way he just pulled one out of his head. I'll give him the same pay that we're we're both making right now here, huh? <laughs> so you're gonna pay him a hundred bucks a show. <laughs> I get paid. Who gets paid a hundred bucks a show? <laughs> man, I've been writing you checks and didn't know it. <laughs> I just take it out of the account. Man. Oh man, you are a banker with uh, with all the connections you need. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate that, Andy. I'll try to work that in. That's that's a good one. Yeah. i got to write these down. So uh, we hope to catch you guys next week. If you're in the Wichita area, Wichita, Kansas, it's in the middle of the United States, uh, hit us up. Give us an email or message us online there, and uh, we'd be happy to have you down and train with us. Yeah, and definitely tune in next week. We have uh, Jared Dopp um, from Lovato's Jiu-Jitsu uh, going to be on the show for an interview next week, so uh, don't miss that. Yep, he, he was the purple belt that did so well at the uh, at ADCC last time he just he, he really just shocked the world like who is this guy and how's this purple belt uh, competing so well against these high level black belts so uh, fun interview uh, he's very very smart bright guy so uh, a lot of good information from Jared alright my friends I, we look forward to getting back with you next week thanks for listening alright and stay sweaty my friends thank you for listening I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu.
Yeah, he's really tough, cool. man. He is tough. He's really coming together, man. Yeah. Hey, can you uh, can you hear the window? I got to open it a little bit, and I think uh, I can't hear it at I all. Can't. Let me. I'm gonna close it. Hold on a second. Man, I, I don't want birds birds chirping at me. You know what I mean? So yeah, your neighbor will start cutting the grass. <laughs> yeah. It's like me last week when I started coughing. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta get the, this damn thing's like stuck, man. <laughs> Stupid. You better get, hope you get it closed, get, otherwise you're going to freeze I need tonight. to get new windows, man. I, I, hold on. <laughs> oh, gee, oh. <laughs> You're messing with me. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, dang it. You didn't buy it at all, did you? <laughs> I did until I heard that break. <laughs> I was like, he's messing with me. Oh, man, I tried. <laughs> that was good, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna act all hurt and see what you did, but uh, you didn't buy it. <laughs> You're over there with a cut arm, and I'm. Just like, <laughs> hey, let me let me hit the record button, Carrie. <laughs>